Today we're talking about chapter 18, section 2, which is how we classify organisms based on their evolutionary relationship. It can be very difficult to classify some organisms, such as the pangolin that we see here in this picture, because it has some traits that are very much mammal-like. It does have hair on its belly. But then notice it has all of these scales, kind of like a pine cone. Um, and scales are not something that we typically would associate with mammals. So some organisms, such as the pangolin that you see here, can be very difficult to classify just based on how they look. And so we need to investigate a little bit deeper into their evolutionary relationships and come up with a classification system based on that. So this is going to be the study of cladistics, uh, which is basically the groups that we put organisms into. Um, and when we talk about it, we will also kind of interchangeably use the term phylogeny. Um, phylogeny is just the evolutionary history of a group of species. And we get this information from a lot of different sources, obviously studying the actual living species, uh, we can look in the fossil record and figure out a phylogeny for extinct species. And then we also use molecular data, things like DNA sequences or amino acid sequences. The goal is to classify organisms, and we do that by how they're related to each other. And we use a diagram called a cladogram. A cladogram, such as what you see here on the screen, is going to have species at the tips of these branches. So A, B, C, and D represent four different species that we are grouping together. And we're classifying based on how they have different traits in common with each other. So the traits are going to be represented by these hash marks and the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. So the way this works is at the very base of your cladogram, which is also called a phylogenetic tree, I'll use those terms interchangeably, at the very base, we have some ancestor. This is probably an extinct species. It's not something that's currently living today. But that ancestor gave rise to a line of descendants. And at some point, some descendant of that ancestor had trait number one, whatever trait number one is. Maybe it was having eyes. Maybe the ancestor didn't have eyes, but some of the descendants somewhere along the way developed eyes. Well, if that is our trait one, then we would assume, based on the structure of this cladogram, that eyes, it appeared here, and it is carried through all of the rest of the branches on that tree. So whenever a trait appears, it's going to be present from that point on for the entire rest of that cladogram. So trait number two here, maybe this is something like having a jaw. Some of the earliest organisms didn't have a hinged jaw. They couldn't open and close their mouth. Um, so maybe that is a trait that appeared a little bit later in the fossil record. So if number two is the presence of a jaw, then that would be present in species B, C, and D, but not present in species A because notice the branch for species A diverges or it branches off from these descendants before that new trait shows up. So trait two is only present from this point on through the rest of those three branches. And so on and so forth. We can see how a, B, C, and D are going to share some traits in common, but then they also have some differences. And that's the goal of cladistics or creating a cladogram is to group these organisms based on the traits that they share. So let's look at an example here. This is an example that it shows you different types of plants. And we're going to use this to discuss what a clade actually is. Um, this is where cladistics, or the word cladogram, even comes from. The clade is the group of species that share a common ancestor. So ferns, conifers, and flowers together make up a clade within the plant kingdom that is characterized by plants that all have vascular tissue. That's kind of like the blood vessels of a plant. It allows the transport of water and nutrients up and down the stem. Um, 
So all of these plants here share a common ancestor, and that ancestor had vascular tissue and passed it down to all of its descendants. So whenever we have one ancestor and we're including all of the descendants from that ancestor in our group, that is a clade. So let's look at this in a bit more detail. We have algae, mosses, ferns, conifers, and flowers. And we can add some information to this cladogram to see how they're related. And for practice, you actually have a place where you can label this on your power notes as well. Uh, so let's just take a look at that real quick. All right, so here is the cladogram from your power notes. Notice that it just has four species on this cladogram, and it tells you at the bottom to ignore algae since they aren't true plants. But if you wanted to add algae to this cladogram, it would kind of go right here behind that box for ancestral trait. And you could just put it right there on that cladogram, and then it matches the one from the notes. So let's take a look at those notes again. We have in this cladogram here, algae as the very first branch that come off. And then there is going to be some new trait that arises here before any of these other branches, the mosses, ferns, conifers, and flowers. That trait is going to be a cuticle. A cuticle is just a coating to prevent water loss. Algae don't have that. Algae have to live in the water or in very wet environments. So having a cuticle allows mosses, ferns, conifers, and flowers to thrive on land. So on your cladogram, this little hash mark right here is actually going to be the presence of a cuticle. So you can label that there. So then let's look and see what our next trait is. After cuticle, we have vascular tissue. We already know that one because we've talked about this as being the vascular plant clade. This ancestor had vascular tissue and passed it down to all of its descendants. So in your cladogram, vascular tissue goes here. Okay, and then finally, after that vascular tissue, now we're in this clade, now we have the appearance of seeds. So conifers and flowers have seeds, but ferns do not. So we can add seeds. And then in between species C and D, the very next trait is going to be flowers. There's not a line there for it, but you can add a line for flowers. Let's zoom in on that. And now you can see that we have the cuticle, vascular tissue, seeds, and flowers as these traits that have appeared in our cladogram here. Now let's go in and label our different species according to what we have in the cladogram. We already wrote algae. Our next plant species, species A, would be mosses. Then species B would be ferns. Species C is conifers. Just find a place to add that in. And then species D would be flowers or flowering plants. So once you have your finished cladogram, it should look something like this right here. So now let's define some of those terms that are indicated in your cladogram. We're going to start with a derived trait. A derived trait is a characteristic that you find in some members of a clade but the common ancestor does not have it. So a good example um, in terms of mammals 
would be their ancestors, tetrapods or four-legged creatures. They did not have fur, but mammals all have some type of hair or fur. So that is a derived trait. It shows up in the line that just leads to mammals and it is shared between all mammals. If we go back momentarily and look at this cladogram that we just did for plants, the derived traits would be things like vascular tissue is the shared derived trait for this entire group of organisms here of ferns, conifers, and flowers. The non-derived trait or the trait that the ancestor had is called an ancestral trait. So an ancestral trait would be something like the cuticle. The cuticle was present in the ancestor that led to all plants. Remember, algae are not true plants, um, but this ancestor here that is the ancestor of all plants, it had a cuticle, and therefore all of its descendants have a cuticle as well. So the cuticle would be an ancestral trait for all plants. Ancestral traits are traits that were present in the ancestor of whatever group you're looking at. So in our cladogram here, the other term that you will come across is the term node. A node is simply this branch point right here. So basically right at the crook of that Y shape where one branch leads um, to the frog and the salamander right here and another branch leads to everything else. This is the node. Each node represents an ancestor and whatever this ancestor was, some of its descendants became these guys right here. Some of its descendants went on to become these guys and so on and so forth. So the node is not a currently existing organism. It represents some kind of ancestor and it is the shared ancestor between whatever is on the two branches that come out of that node. So this is a shared common ancestor between the frog and the salamander and the elephant and the rabbit, for example because if you track this line all the way down to the point where it reaches a node with the salamander and the frog, that's this point right here. So that means this represents the shared common ancestor between the frog, salamander, and the elephant, rabbit branches. Now what we are noticing here, we've got clades identified again. Remember a clade is just going to be an ancestor and all of its descendants. So this clade, the diapsids, uh, these are going to be all of the descendants from the ancestor at this node right here um, that possess an opening in the side of the skull, the skull openings behind the eye, the embryo protected by amniotic fluid, and four limbs with digits. All of those traits would be considered ancestral traits for the diapsid clade because this ancestor present at the node right here had all of those traits that came before it. And then if we look at the this last clade within the diapsid clade, a skull opening in the front of the eye and jaw, this would be a derived trait that is shared between the Archosauria clade, but was absent in the snakes and lizards that you see here. So that would make it a shared derived trait just for this clade right here. And then for this entire cladogram, if we're looking for what is the ancestral trait for every single organism in this cladogram, that would be the four limbs with digits. That is the ancestral trait for this entire clade. It was present even in the earliest ancestor um, at any of these nodes that we find along the way. So hopefully this helps to distinguish between shared traits and uh, or derived traits and ancestral traits, but please, if there are any questions about that, make sure you ask about them in class and we can certainly go through some more examples.
Another thing to know about a cladogram is that you don't read it across the tips of the branches. We wouldn't read this from left to right and say that the fish is the most primitive thing and the human is the most advanced thing because the fish is on the left and the human's on the right. We really read it more from bottom to top. So if we look at the root of this tree here, this ancestor, one line of descendants became the fish, another line of descendants diverged and became things like the frog or the lizard or the goose. So it is acceptable to write these relationships in the way that you see here, but if we flip this around, this is the exact same cladogram. It doesn't matter if humans are on the right or the left. What matters is they always have the node in the same place. They always have that shared common ancestor in the same location. So the most recent common ancestor between the human and the cat is right here in either way that we put it. If we put it back to where it was originally, or if we flip this around, we still have that ancestor occurring in the exact same place. It doesn't have to just be these tips. It could be another node closer to the bottom of the tree. We can absolutely rearrange this node as well if you were to rotate that around. We haven't changed any ancestors we still have the human and the cat being most closely related and the goose and the lizard being most closely related over here. And then both of those groups shared an ancestor in this position. So even though we have rotated around this node, we haven't changed any of the relationships depicted in that cladogram. So the best way to use that information when you're interpreting a cladogram is to think about reading from the ground up. Look at the positions of the nodes, think about what's most closely related and what shares a common ancestor closest to the bottom, and as long as those positions are the same in two different trees, those trees are showing you the same relationship. So take a look at these two cladograms See if you think they are showing the same relationship. You can go ahead and pause that video if you need to think about it for a minute. And once you have your answer, go ahead and hit play. All right, let's talk about these two cladograms. Notice that this node, which we're showing with a red arrow, shows a split between species A and everything else. That is the same in both of these cladograms. We have a node where we split A off from the rest of those species. That's happening in both of these cladograms. Next, we look at this blue node. This shows the split between clades B, F, and C. So B, F, and C make up one clade. Here's their ancestor. Those are all the descendants. And then D and E would be a separate clade. So it shows that on one branch we have B, C, and F, on the other branch we have D and E. Look over in this cladogram, we have B, C, and F, and then we have D and E on a separate branch. So again, showing us the same thing. And then finally, if we look at this green node, that shows where species B is going to split off from the rest of the clade F and C. So we see that happening here, there's B, and then there's F and C. And in this cladogram, it branches off to B, and then here's F and C. And then D and E, I don't have an arrow for that, but you can see D and E um, branch off closest to the top, F and C branch off close to the top, and that's the same in both of them as well. So that was a very long-winded way of saying that these two cladograms both show the same relationships. And one final thought that I will leave you with today is that the way species are related, it really comes down to molecular evidence today. We really rely on DNA sequences or amino acid sequences to tell us if our classifications are correct. So here's a good example. 
before we used molecular data, if we just look at the similarities between organisms, we thought because of body segmentation that these segmented worms and arthropods would be more closely related to each other. And then the mollusks, and then more distantly would be the flatworms and the roundworms. Well, actually, after looking at sequence data and assuming that similarities in DNA sequences means more closely related, we now classify them differently. Flatworms, mollusks, and segmented worms had much more DNA similarity, and therefore we would put them together in one clade, and the roundworms and the arthropods were actually different in terms of DNA sequences, so they get put in their own clade. So this is really a field where we see classification schemes changing all the time based on new evidence and new data. And generally speaking, the last word, the, the gold standard of how we decide if things are related to each other is using DNA evidence. The only other thing that we are going to discuss in this section is how to actually create your own cladogram. And I will walk through the steps of this in a separate video, but if you want to go ahead and make a note of these steps in your Power Notes, I'll go ahead and pause it and do that now, and then stay tuned for another video to talk about how to actually create it.